So for part two of week 10, we're going to talk about different landforms and landform environments, and then I get to end with one of my favorite stories about the Oregon coast. Uh, when we're looking at depositional landforms, we're going to think predominantly um, that large-scale depositional landforms are happening on continental edges that have gentle slopes, um, they have low relief, they're tip typically the trailing edge of a plate. So if you think about the uh, North America plate moving kind of northwest, that eastern coastal plate um, is a more quiet energy, unless we're having, of course, um, hurricanes. So there's some uh, classic uh, landforms that you get that happen because of the low energy. Um, you get a barrier spit, a tombolo, a long, elongated, well-developed beaches and deltas. So we'll look at a few of these. Uh, this is an example of a tombolo and it's kind of a connecting uh, bridge or, or path or uh, pathway, I guess, between um, two, land, two islands or between an island and the continent or two land masses. And you can imagine that in an, in an area with very high waves, this would be eroded easily. But in, in quieter waters, uh, the landforms protect it and you get this kind of classic uh, bridging. Here's another one um, that shows kind of a, a depositional landform out to this, uh, this little island. Um, here are just very long, this is I think North Carolina, South Carolina, um, you get these uh, barrier islands, you get long, long developed beaches, um, you see piers way out into, into the water, um, you don't see that as much on very active coastlines. Um, and another thing that's very common with uh, low energy coasts or depositional coastlines are deltas. So um, the, the uh, Columbia River has a huge uh, sediment load, but the wave action is uh, so energetic that you really can't have the, the, the uh, a delta will not develop at the mouth of the Columbia, where in the Gulf of Mexico, um, where the Mississippi runs, you have a very well-developed delta. So I just took Google Earth out to uh, out to the mouth of the Columbia, and you know, you can see sediment in the water. So the lighter color is probably sand and sediment. So there are a lot of bars, underwater bars, but you don't see the development of that uh, delta. So let's go to Egypt and see if we can, if this will fly. My flyer has not been working today, so um, I do not know. Hold on. So here at the mouth of the Nile is a classic delta, actually, where the delta got its name, but you can really see um, how well developed this form is. So here's the the mouth of the, the Nile originally, but over time it has built up this this landscape as it flows and channelizes channelizes out into the water. You have to have a, a very low energy to maintain that. Um, big waves would, would be constantly eroding that that area. So if we move to erosional landforms, then you're going to see those on coastlines that have a very high relief, uh, that are very rugged. They're probably tectonically active so that there uh, is subduction. Um, there are emerging coastlines or rebounding and subsiding coastlines up and down. Um, and here you're going to see cliffs, sea caves, arches, stacks, uh, isolated stack remnants, and uh, wave cut uh, platforms or terraces. So the classic uh, arch, um, so a lot of erosion, what's left, it's kind of waves are, are uh, eating at uh, the weaker spots. Um, you can see, I don't, yeah, right here you can see kind of a, a notch. Um, this is a wave cut notch that's very classic. And so what happens with this uh, process is the waves uh, attack this spot because this is where the the sea level is uh, constantly eroding and impinging on the rock and it inevitably weakens the supports and causes uh, more backwards erosion. Here is an image of uh, stacks, very rugged, much different looking coastline than the people standing out on a pier fishing um, along the, the west coast, high mountains. These mountains could be rising up as, as far as tectonic uh, lifting, uh, a lot of earthquakes, uh, movement uh, causing mass movements, and then remnants as uh, supporting pieces are eroded. Here is um, a wave cut platform, and you can see how um, 
God, move that silly hand. How um, flat and eroded this is. This is uh, what you're looking at is a former sea floor, sea bed, and over time that piece of land has been uplifted out of the current wave zone. And we'll look at uh, at that here in, um, again in a minute. Um, here's an example just of landslides, coastal erosion happening along these erosional. Uh, tectonic coasts. So wave cut platforms, this was my, my big attempt at uh, drawing in Google or on uh, PowerPoint here. So let's say you have your, your ocean here and you've got your active uh, wave uh, surf zone here and you may uh, look away from the ocean and see kind of these step-like features going uh, inland and usually they will represent former uh, wave zones and so as tectonic uplift happens um, these portions get uh, raised out of the current uh, erosion and deposition zone um, and uh, there's a place in uh, Oregon I think called Seven Devils where there are seven levels of uh, terraces these wave cut terraces or platforms and often um, these are where you'll find homes and people who are smart and build up on these terraces because they're out of the erosion zone. Um, they're far enough away to avoid kind of the caves and the, the uh, dangers with uh, an active coastline. Um, one thing I want you to be able to talk about is the differences between um, a summer beach profile and a winter, winter beach profile. And so um, you know what would be helpful here? Let me try something. This could be a horrible disaster, but I'm just, I don't, yeah, let me just try to hold on. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Dang it. Anyway, um, the, and this is all, uh, I'm going to send that to the back. There we go. Um, the summer beach profile, we're talking uh, temperature summer, not season summer. So, in uh, in the southern hemisphere, the summer beach profile would happen in uh, January, December, and in the northern hemisphere, the summer beach profile would happen in June and July. So, in the summer beach profile, you tend to have um, a deposition of sand. The waves come in; um, they will deposit sand in in like a berm at the edge of the of the uh, wave zone. Um, the, the beach has more sand on it. Um, uh, it tends to be maybe a little convex looking, not concave looking. So this is kind of gentle, uh, low winds, um, a depositional kind of full beach. The winter beach, however, tends to look scoured or dug out. Um, a lot of the sand, because of lar large waves, big winds, big storms, has waves have come way up on the shore. They've pulled that sand out of the beach and it's stored often off the coastline um, as a sandbar. And you get this scoured out or convex looking uh, beach profile. And then in the summer, the sand will be moved back up gently over time back onto um, the beach zone. So here's kind of an example of a scoured uh, winter looking beach where there's bigger, bigger waves. So what do people do to kind of keep, keep the sand on the beach? There are several processes um, that humans ha go through, like we talked about uh, last week using riprap and other kinds of uh, elements to keep uh, rivers in their channels or oops, keep them from meandering. Um, people build groins and jetties to keep the sand from moving. So this is an example of a groin. It's constructed uh, perpendicular to the shoreline and the idea is to block the uh, stream, the longshore drift or the longshore transport by um, catching the sand as it comes up and not letting it go back into the water and so building this little um, constriction and so it would look somewhat like this if you uh, have your original shoreline the transport is moving the sand down the beach uh, from left to right and then these groins would begin to uh, begin to collect the sand and build up kind of an accretion or an angle of sand um, so here's another example. You can kind of see 
from this from this image you know that the trans uh, transport of the sand is going from the lower right hand corner of the image to the upper left hand corner and the sand is being uh, collected or caught on that uh, transport side of the groin um, and so it kind of gives you that zigzag pattern a jetty is built um, as a way to protect the mouth of, of a bay or an inlet and so here are two jetties and they work they work as uh, individual groins on on uh, on the beach now one of the problems is that if you don't have active sand transport um, the beach below the groin will be eroded because there's no sand to trade in that in that process of drift and so their uh, sand will be taken from this side and moved down the coast and this will eventually cause a breach or a breakthrough and so one of the things um, that you see in many areas where they have uh, groins to address that starving beach is that they will let me move back up here they will actually put in a dredge or a pump and grab sand from here take it to the other side of the groin and spit the sand back um, on on that side which brings us to uh, my favorite story of uh, coastal processes the curious tale of Bay Ocean Oregon um, and one of the websites I found uh, <laughs> the the town that paid for its own doom which is kind of a dreary a dreary example so um, Bay Ocean was a proposed resort town um, back in 1970 by a man named T.B. Potter. Doesn't that sound the stuff of uh, TV movies? And uh, this is, was a spit of land out from Tillamook Bay along a very rugged uh, highway, um, which many times people had to actually use the... Uh, use the coast as the highway during part of that period when the tide would go out they would get the buggies across and get it back up on the highland when the tide came back in but uh, Mr. Potter proposed the building of a, a resort um, in 1907 on that spit and uh, by 1915 it boasted some pretty amazing uh, development uh, there were plans for a grand hotel um, there was a notorium. Let's see if I have a picture. Yeah, here's the notorium. Uh, the notorium was an indoor swimming pool that had uh, uh, seawater. It was ocean water. They had uh, a school. They had 2,000 lots were sold. 60 homes were built. Um, but because the highway was so uh, uh, dangerous and, and not always reliable and it took a long time, sometimes boats would come into Tillamook Bay. And so uh, to make the entrance to Tillamook Bay a little more uh, user-friendly, uh, people contracted with the uh, Corps of Engineers to work out an engineering solution for this. And so what they proposed was to put a jetty on either side of the bay uh, entrance. So basically, they would put a jetty uh, right here um, and a jetty right here. And that way, uh, the waves coming from this direction would not make the bay entrance so rough because they would be caught by the jetty. So, um, and, the, and they uh, levied taxes on the people that were living there to help pay for um, that jetty. And so they began work on the jetty in 1914. And so um, this was the, the location of the, f of the first part of the jetty, um, and this also would help stabilize the highway, and then major uh, drift is from the north to the south. So what they found, and not too uh, many years after the jetty was completed, uh, is that the jetty worked really well, but too well, because what it did was stop uh, the sand transport down the beach so that one side of the jetty filled with sand and the other side of the jetty which was the actual town of Bay Ocean um, was starved of uh, sand 
So no new sand was contributed to the jetty, and by the time the schoolhouse was opened, uh, the notorium had to be closed because the sand underneath it had become unstable. There was a breakthrough of ocean water into the bay, and um, basically the town just eventually... Uh, washed away. There are some uh, old images of people moving houses, trying to get them out before uh, the area was inundated. Um, since then, um, they built a, a second jetty, which has helped the sand transport, and the island is again connected. Um, but the other interesting fact is if you, uh, so here's the existing jetty. When, when the jetty was built, the land inside this red triangle did not exist, and now um, it's uh, very well developed. It has a few uh, freshwater lakes back behind the dunes and um, I could just imagine people here who had seafront or oceanfront property at the time and now they're uh, you know half a mile from from the beach zone. So um, again you know you have to be really careful uh, how you manage these uh, dynamic systems and, and Bay Ocean is a great example of uh, uh, over managing or, or incorrectly managing a system. So that finishes up the term and um, I hope I hope uh, I hope it's been a good one for you. Thanks.